Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, Bluetooth mess, you know, for the Internet of Things. AMD Radeon Vega Frontier Edition, Liquid Cool, Dell's XPS 27 all-in-one, quad-core, Kobe Lake RCPUs, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 424, recorded on July 20th, 2017. Bluetooth will run everything. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most informative, most delightful, and occasionally. The chipperest news in PC, mobile, desktop, portable, Internet of Things, or the Internet of Stuff, as some people would call it. Uh, we we loves the hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Ryan Shrout, or almost always. You uh, you did something scary. <laughs> you uh, you bought a battery yeah. off of eBay to put in your production laptop. Well, yes. Yes. Uh, so basically what happened is I, I have a Broadwell E uh, XPS 13 that has just shown the signs of battery age, right? Where the, the charges are, just don't last as long. Um, battery life is, is just noticeably lower than it used to be. So uh -huh. I, I asked some people at Dell and they don't actually sell the batteries for this laptop anymore. You can't buy a new one. So I did what you do next and you go look around, right? So you went on Amazon or eBay or whatever. And I found one that, you know, said it was new and I looked at the pictures of it and it seemed to match up with all the labeling and description of uh, the one I have it has the same part number listed. Um, so I was like, okay, it was like $29 plus shipping or something like that. I was like, okay, we'll give this, we'll give this a shot. Um, and got it in. You know, went through like a battery test on the current state of my laptop just so I could have a good before after type thing. Uh, you know, took it apart. It's not like a easily replaceable battery. You got to take the whole back of the laptop off. But once you get in there, it's not that big of a problem. Swapped it in. Uh, tried to turn it on. It wouldn't turn on. I go, oh, okay. Well, clearly the the battery is just completely dead. And um, plug it into AC and turn it on and it works. And it boots up and it's actually now it says it has 100% battery and I go, well, that's pretty odd. Uh, and then I realized that the light on the front of the machine that is white when it's charging or plugged in or uh, orange <laughs> oh, no. when it's low is, is just flashing orange continuously. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. So then I just unplug the AC from it and the whole machine shuts down. I'm like, okay. The battery, I, maybe I installed the battery incorrectly. So I take it apart again. I look through it. I make sure the connection oh. is in tight from the battery. You know, everything's there uh, and the same behavior repeats itself. So um, that battery was bad. And then I had, I, I called up some friends at Dell and I said, hey, I had this happen. Do you, do you have any somewhere, sitting where, somewhere? And so they, they ended up going and they found a, an XPS 13 in the lab that they took the, that they, you know, salvaged the battery out of to send to me. And I went through that replacement Aww. process and it works and it works just fine. Um, but I, I've now, um, when I say power cycled it, I mean, um, uh, uh, like fully charged it, fully discharged it, fully charged it, fully discharged it, uh, three times now. And the battery life is almost identical to the old battery I had. <laughs> So I don't know if the battery they sent me was just it had gone through a lot of charge cycles as well or or what. So now I'm now I'm at this point now where I feel like in order to get better battery life, I need to like buy a new laptop. And that's that's a bad feeling. But it's kind of it's kind of the. Is it a very you know, specific battery sort of size or layout? There's no. Yeah. I mean, that's what gets really frustrating because. With a lot of devices, you start getting into, you know, at one point you would open up a device, let's say a, an early iPod, and it would be sort of a standard, um, you know, lithium ion or polymer battery, uh, lithium ion polymer battery, battery pack inside of there. And, mm. you know, obviously you couldn't buy one from Apple, but you could buy one from a reputable source that would be in decent shape. And as the design of the battery becomes more, um, 
sort of integrated to the design of the device, especially as devices get thinner and thinner. It seems like it's getting harder and harder in some cases to find batteries that will actually work in a given application. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's, they're very thin because, um, you know, you're, you're going into like ultra thin and light ba- uh, laptops. Um, no, I, I wouldn't expect that to be able to use any other kind of battery just with it. I have like an, and the sad part is, is I have an external battery, like a, like Dell sells an accessory, like 20,000 milliamp hour or whatever kind of like external battery that will both charge your laptop and other USB devices. And I've had that for the same amount of time. And it's, it's battery life has also kind of degraded in the standard LiPo life cycle of, of things. Um, and it, it's, it sucks, right? Cause we, we see this on phones and we see this on laptops and we see this on anything that's kind of battery powered these days. Uh, and it's not something we really think about mm-hmm. when you're doing like a review or analysis or a recommendation, because it's not something you right. can even figure out until years into the life cycle of that product. And then it all, and then it very much, it depends on what your usage of it was. Like I happen to go into the firmware on this, like the BIOS essentially on this Dell XPS 13. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's actually settings in there that are uh, meant to maximize the life of the battery. For example, um, you can have it uh, charge more slowly if you tell it, I'm almost always plugged in. So don't try to charge these batteries fast. Because that will degrade the life of the battery more quickly, those types of things. So there's just there's interesting settings in here, and I just I feel like uh, that's maybe an area of uh, uh, of expansion of growth of research that could be improved upon on all these things. Because everybody has the complaint on their iPhone or on their right. you know MacBook or whatever it happens to be, uh, but nobody nobody talks. I don't I don't think I've ever seen a product release where they talk about like the the life cycle of their battery. Like, hey, this battery is going to last you at least two years or at least four years without degradation and that type of stuff. And as an owner of an electric car, I kind of, you know, and I make those those same types of questions and whatnot. So I, it'll be interesting to see. It will be interesting to see. Something that uh, I thought was a little odd uh, that uh, came out this week was that Bluetooth, uh, the Bluetooth Consortium has announced that they are... Um, bringing mesh networking to Bluetooth and, uh, you know, yeah. So Bluetooth SIG, Bluetooth four and five devices will be able to communicate in a mesh network. And when you go to the, uh, release on the, uh, Bluetooth SIG, uh, website, um, it is ideally suited for building automation, sensor networks, and other Internet of Things solutions where tens, hundreds, or thousands of devices need to reliably and securely communicate with one another. And all I could think was like, isn't this what Zigbee and Z-Wave were built for like 10 years ago? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, except this is being done by the Bluetooth consortium and, and uh, you know, huh. Zigbee is a little, you know, proprietary. Z-Wave is, is a little more open uh, or at least was back in the day. You know, and it's, uh, I'm very curious to see what happens, right? Because, you know, when you look at this, they've got a lot of quotes, Right, because like almost everything announced in the world of Bluetooth, you you get an announcement, and then several decades later, it seems like um, products start to ship using the technology. But uh, or at least it's the way it feels. Um, you know, are the the vice president of marketing wireless business unit from Arm, the addition of mesh to the Bluetooth standard will open up significant opportunities for richer experiences in smart homes and building automation, enabling fresh waves of innovation across a range of IoT applications. Low power connectivity is essential to bringing the next generation of secure IoT devices to life. Um, you know, also putting secure and IoT in the same sentences is, is pretty amusing at this point. But uh, you know, this is also Bluetooth trying to remain viable in an era when uh, you know billions and billions and billions, like tens of billions of of Internet of Things randomness, are going to be stuffed into your home. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'll be really curious. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, is it was everybody waiting for Bluetooth? But then again, I don't really see how that's going to work. Um, what's pretty crazy is, is you know, you know, they're claiming Bluetooth mesh can extend Bluetooth range up to 200 meters, which is pretty huge. Um, or I should say, some of their customers are saying uh, Bluetooth mesh can extend the range of their products up to 200 meters. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how this gets implemented. And what, uh, you know, what we see at first rolling out. Because, like, I think they started writing about mesh 
back in 2014, probably the first time I saw something on the Bluetooth.com website on that. Um, you know, it's also interesting to watch consumer pubs, um, you know, like The Verge. Bluetooth is getting a big upgrade to make it better for smart homes, and everything you look at on the website is radically tightly focused on enterprise uh, and massive office buildings and you know production environments and asset tracking over uh, active RFID. Um, right. I was curious, you know, uh, you know, and, and one of the other lines uh, that I saw somewhere uh, type is, "Oh, just what we need." Another smart home standard. <laughs> yeah, that that one's not you know. wrong. Yeah, um, uh, I, you know, I, I do like. I, I mean, I like the idea of just extending Bluetooth range through sure. the, the mesh networking idea. Like, even even in like our office space like this, it would just kind of be nice if, like, hey, every computer that has Bluetooth on it, just turn on the Bluetooth, right. and it now it's providing some range ex range extension for yeah. other products as and you it's, move around. It's not right, but range extension like you know, I I put an antenna on my Wi-Fi adapter, or I bought a Wi-Fi adapter with increased sensitivity and a better antenna. It's literally going to have to hop from you know Bluetooth device to Bluetooth device to Bluetooth device to Bluetooth device, and they're all going to have to have Bluetooth four or five, and they're all going to have to have the firmware yeah. updates that make this actually work. Which, right. if you're familiar with Internet of Things devices, there's lots of things that would make this really useful that will probably never receive any firmware updates that would make it possible for that um right you know yeah you know it's uh it, it i'll be you know i'll be curious right because you know there, a lot of the things that they're trying to solve with this have already been solved in other areas um where it gets really interesting is when you're talking about super ultra low power devices um that don't need to sort of ping back very often um yeah you know I love that it doesn't require new hardware. I love that it's compatible with Bluetooth 4 and Bluetooth 5. Um, you know, and the Bluetooth SIG, by the way, did tell the birds that they expect to see new Bluetooth standards entering the market about six months after they're released. Uh, and they expect Bluetooth mesh to show up even sooner. So uh, I would like to officially not rescind, but suggest that my, you know, thoughts uh, on Bluetooth seeming to be announced years before it shows up, uh, maybe inaccurate. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I was also, I gotta say, shocked that uh, you are not ready to buy the spectacles on Amazon. <laughs> uh, you're, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I no, mean, I, I, I you went out of your way to tweet your distinct lack of interest. <laughs> It was a simple answer of for somebody well, somebody tweeted that you can buy spectacles on Amazon, and I simply retweeted no, and that was it. I, I just I don't. This is it's not yeah, not your thing. Not my line. No, no. I don't know, man. You could rock those. Things. Do you have a couple of pair already or something? Or am, oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be tempting. Um, if I had any interest in uh, round photos, round video, or wandering around looking like a total creeper, um, you know, yeah. these things make. Yeah, I was, I was, I was at, uh, I was at VidCon, and you know, teenagers wandering around with with spectacles look peculiar, uh, and I think adults wandering around with snap spectacles <laughs> would look downright creepy. Um, I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Feel free to tweet at Patrick Norton or email me, but uh, it was a funny moment. Man, you all get them, ones make sure used you, to make sure you get the, the the teal ones. There's nothing wrong with teal sunglasses, man. No. I mean, they might clash with your hair aggressively, <laughs> but probably. I think I could pull them off. I mean, I think I could do it. I don't know if you heard that behind me, but uh, I've been. Uh, Wiping, so I got to return it to Dell. The uh, XPS twenty seven seventy seven sixty all in one, uh, and in the process of of you know wiping it, it goes in the reboot process, and then Cortana suddenly started speaking behind me. Um, ah, for Windows help. setup. Yes, <laughs> which I'm just finding. Speaking of spectacles and creepiness, uh, more and more peculiar each time I do it. Um, but yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, it always used to be like. You could get it all in one. It would look really, really good. 
you know, it would look kind of fabulous. Uh, and mm -hmm. you'd have, you know, typical to mediocre laptop performance. And that was the thing that really stood out for me, taking a look at the Dell XPS 27, um, was uh, that it is not slow. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, Core i7, uh, you know, like a Core i7 uh, 7700, <coughs> pardon me, um, to me, Core i7, uh, yeah, Core i7 uh, uh, 7700, um, 16 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 64 gigabytes max, um, which was really kind of exciting as an option. Um, the uh, yeah, gorgeous 27-inch 4K monitor, um, you know, an AMD RX 570 GPU, which, you know, you and I were texting about. Because um, when mm -hmm. I first fired up Rocket League on the XPS 2700, the graphics were set to a 1920 by 1440, which is a 4 by 3 mode with black bars on the side, um, you know, which is kind of awkward when you're looking at a 4K monitor. Um, I ended up resetting Rocket League to like 2048 by 1152, which filled the monitor. There's a fair amount of tearing. Um, you know, but the thing that kind of struck me is, is as much as I would like to see more um, graphic power, to back up a 4K monitor, um, you know, it was, I just want to say 6.5% faster than the Core i7-6700 desktop I built, uh, uh, you know, back in the, the early 2015, um, excuse me, late 2015. Um, and the gaming was just fine. Um, mm. And, you know, you can get up to 64 gigabytes of RAM in it. So if you're looking for an all-in-one oh. that's not going to cripple you with using Photoshop or video editing, um, you know, yeah, if you are a super elite hacks or gamer and you need all of the refresh rate, uh, this is probably not the design for you. But it was amazing for me, you know, just being like, this is an all-in-one. It renders video as fast as my desktop at home. Admittedly, a year-old desktop at home, but it's not like there's been huge leaps uh, between the 6700 and the 7700 in terms of performance. Um, it has a massive amount of RAM. Uh, that you can upgrade to. It's got two two and a half inch drive slots. Um, it's got an M.2 space on the motherboard, so you can put a fair amount of storage into it. It's a little odd. Most of the uh, configurations on it come with a 32 gigabyte uh, M.2 SATA SSD cache and like a one or two terabyte 5400 RPM hard drive. Um, huh. You know, so that'll speed up your operating system and your frequently used apps. But uh, I would almost immediately want to upgrade that to a standard SSD. And like I said, there's two two and a half inch drive slots inside of there, so there's room to expand memory. There's room mm. to expand, um, um, you know, the the storage inside of that. Touchscreen's optional. Um, so if you buy the oh, before I talk about the touchscreen. The speakers on this are kind of insane. They've got what amounts to a hundred watt sound bar built into the bottom. Uh, of the monitor and they are very very proud there's a couple of passive radiators so on the outside there's a tweeter you know there's two light mid ranges and in a full firing or a full range uh, speaker firing down and then with that other speaker on the back a passive radiator on the back to help the boost um, it's pretty crazy uh, so excuse me four full range drivers two tweeters two and then the uh, the two full range drivers that point down and the passive radiators on the back and it was like really impressive sound staging um, you know, for recordings that have it, Amber Rubar's uh, Sessions from the 13 Ward comes to mind. You know, some really nice detail on the highs on Coltrane to Love Supreme. Um, you know, what's frustrating, though, is they did all this work on building these incredible speakers into it, and they're great for casual listening, um, but it just drops off a cliff below 70 hertz. Um, so, like, the thud of the impacts in Kung Fu Panda weren't there. Um, kick drums don't have a lot of impact. You know, like, Rage Against the Machine, there was, like, a lot of the low-end presence or clutch uh, wasn't there, which was a little disappointing because uh, beyond that, they're they're pretty pretty amazing uh, audio wise. Although I will say, with a four mic at desk, those downward firing uh, full range speakers seem to bounce a, a little bit, not quite too much, but almost too much uh, treble. You can see uh, the basic version. Um, the uh, there's a, a basic stand that comes with the non touchscreen version. The touchscreen version adds four hundred dollars to the price, uh, but it you know allows you to collapse the thing down into a flat mode uh, in front of you. Um, I could have used a couple more inches of height. Yeah, there you can see it right there. Um, but if you're into touchscreens, it's an option. Um, and uh, uh, I gotta say, I, I I would probably not spring the extra four hundred bucks for the touchscreen. I'd buy a one terabyte hard drive SSD for that. Um, oh but, sure. Uh, 
the touchscreen worked, you know, it worked like a touchscreen. It worked perfectly fine. It's an incredibly shiny monitor, uh, which isn't too bad in my office environment. But if you like to work with, you know, giant sunny windows, you're probably going to want to take care in positioning it. I was really, like I said, it was really kind of amazing to use an all-in-one that, you know, not only looked good, but delivered decent performance. Maybe not for hardcore gamers, but if you're, if you're talking about, like, you know, video editing yeah. or, or playing with audio or stuff like that. The one thing that did drive me nuts is the webcams on that are all the way down at the bottom of the monitor. Uh, much like the XPS 13. <laughs> so they're giving yeah. you this, like, sweet Infinity Edge kind of bezel design. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you've got the, you know, this look. Which is not attractive for anyone, <laughs> as near as I can tell, <laughs> um, for the webcam. But uh, starts at uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, starts at fifteen fifty with a Core i five uh, seventy four hundred and eight gigs of RAM uh, and a one terabyte hard drive. Uh, tops out at twenty eight hundred dollars with a Core i seven seventy seven hundred uh, sixteen gigs of RAM, a four K touchscreen, and that f- uh, five hundred twelve gigabyte SSD. Um, mm. I liked it. I really, really would like to see uh, the webcam at the top, even if that means increasing the bezel size a little bit. Um, it also does the IR camera, so you can get Windows Hello going. Um, yep. You know, and if you're a hardcore gamer, you would probably want something with a little more GPU power. But for casual gaming for Rocket League, <laughs> as soon as I started playing, I didn't really think twice about it. Um, Very cool. You know, yeah, I was, uh, I was impressed by that one. The uh, because I've, I've, you know, I, I used a couple different all-in-ones uh, for years, and uh, invariably there was always another computer nearby that I would have to do the serious stuff on, um, right? Like rendering video or or ripping stuff. So, you uh, did you do the live benchmarking stream of AMD's liquid cooled version of the vega frontier edition and if you did was it amazing and tell me does liquid cooling double the performance of the uh, vega uh, frontier edition let's see um no we did not live stream it um mostly because i i didn't expect there to be a significant difference and i knew i was gonna have to break up the testing over two right. days because it was getting late um so we, we didn't we ended up not doing a live stream um is it doubling performance or 50% more performance? No. I will say that the the amount of added gaming performance that we got out of the water-cooled variant of the Vega Frontier Edition compared to the air-cooled was more than I expected. Somewhere around 10 to 12, 10 to 14% kind of across the six different games that we looked at, um, uh-huh. which is interesting because like the, the raw specifications are the same. What differs is the the thermal solution which then allows the card, you know, interestingly, out of the box, the the the, the liquid cooled version hits the same TDP as the air cooled, like it's in its 300 watt setting. But there's a little switch on top behind um, the uh, liquid cooling cables, the mm-hmm. cables going into the card from the from the from the radiator and whatnot. Uh, that is like a BIOS switch, and you turn that switch to the other position and reboot your machine, and you're in the 350 watt version of it and when you're in the 350 watt you know the gpu gets a little bit warmer but it's still mm-hmm. like it's 70 c or below way below what the air cooled card was running at which is like 80 85 c and it does that so and, and when it when the gpu is running at that thermal stability uh the clocks are more uh the, the, the it hits the highest tdp not hits it, it, it hits the highest clock states that it can more often Right. So at 350 watts, you're just you're averaging, you know, 80 to, to 100 megahertz faster than on the air cooled uh, when you're in a mm-hmm. 350 watt state. And as a result, uh, performance goes up a little bit. And in general, the frame time variance is lower because it's not switching clock speeds as much. Now, there are still it's so it's it's a good looking card, by the way. It's the inverse of the air cooled one. The air cooled one was blue with mm-hmm. yellow accents. This one's like a yellowish gold with blue accents. Uh, I will say that I hate blue LEDs, and there are a lot of them on this card, so keep that in mind. <laughs> the water cooling pump is interesting because it's not just a um, uh, like a circulation. It's not like a recirculation reciprocal pump. It's 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 a diaphragm pump inside of it, um, which is huh. fairly unique to uh, does yes, it, does exactly it do the fish tank style sound. Now, and it's 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 quiet. It's quieter than the air cooled card, um, and it's not. 
louder than other self-contained water coolers, but it just sounds different. Um, right. Which it, it's it's hard to describe, but uh, Alan kind of equi uh, equated it to something like a like an older fish tank pump would be, and I, I think that's I think that's pretty close. Um, so a couple of things on the power consumption. So 300 and 350 watts are kind of like the two settings available in the card. Um, mm -hmm. Clock speeds go up a little bit. If you look at our overclocking page, which is the last one, you'll see that we. Uh, uh, we're able to push. So first things first, like if you just take the power target, which now in AMD cards with Polaris, starting with Polaris kind of works just like it does on NVIDIA cards. You just increase the power target, you know, like plus 25%. Um, it raises the power draw, but you get a almost a static 1600 megahertz clock speed, which is what the rated clock of the card is, right? So that increases your power draw, but you get a more stable, higher average, higher average clock speed. Uh, I was able to do plus 25% power, uh, plus seven percent on the GPU clock, which takes the rated GPU clock to 1712. Uh, but in reality, we were bouncing between 1712 and 1637, kind of back and forth on that page. The, the bigger problem, I mean, and that's good, right? So we saw some performance benefit there. However, this comes at the cost of power, where uh, in its overclock state, this card was drawing about 440 watts of power. Um, which is considerable, right? So keeping in mind that the, the, the 1080 Ti, that is the flagship kind of best consumer grade, consumer priced um, uh, gaming card from NVIDIA uses 250 watts. Realize mm -hmm. that in one of the out of box states, depending on the position of the switch, the Vega FE liquid cooled uses 350 watts. So already 100 watts more than that. And then we're getting 90 watts more than that even to get to this overclocked State and you start to understand kind of the extremity of the efficiency advantage that Pascal has at its performance level over uh, Vega. Um, but it is worth noting that even not overclocked, with the liquid cooler running at higher clocks, just because of it running the GPU at a, at a cooler state, the performance was getting pretty close to the 1080. And like you know, like I think Dirt Rally, it was actually at 4K, it was a little bit ahead of mm -hmm. the GTX 1080. Um, and that 10 to 12 percent difference pushed it way, way closer to 1080 than the 1070, whereas the air cooled card was way, way closer to uh, the 1070 than the 1080. So it's it's an interesting kind of uh, experimental card because I would never recommend somebody buy this. It's fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, it's five hundred dollars more than the air cooled card. It's a significant, significant investment. Uh, AMD claims this card is like, you know, targeted at the some kind of in-between area of high-end gaming and professional users, mm -hmm. and that's fine or whatever. I was more using it as a data point for what do we what do we know about Vega? What are we learning about the RX Vega that's going to come right. out at the end of the month uh, or early in August or whatever it's going to be? Um, and it basically gave me more hope than I had before that AMD may be able to produce a part that is competitive with the GTX 1080. Now, I don't think it's mm -hmm. going to be ahead of the GTX 1080, and it's not going to get up to the 1080 Ti. The 1080 Ti was still on average 25 to 35% faster than this liquid-cooled version of the Vega Frontier Edition. But hmm. uh, it, it does mean that, you know, when it was closer to the 1070, you realized that Vega had to confront this $399 price tag. At 1080 levels of performance, you, they can now target a $499 price tag. Uh, and then they right. just get to make decisions on how aggressive they want to be uh, in terms of how much margin they want to have in it, if any. Uh, and then, you know, are they going to try to basically make the argument that uh, we're going to match 1080 performance and match 1080 pricing and know that some people are going to buy our products? So are they going to try to, you know, maybe be $20, $30 less expensive so that mm -hmm. they can claim to have better performance per dollar, even though it is going to be at a much worse performance per watt? Um <laughs> They well, they I mean, have a complicated discussion to have over the next couple of weeks, I think. Is performance per watt as important as a lot of graphics card vendors want us to think it is? I mean, um, you know, performance I, per watt I, is a big deal. If you're thinking about like, gosh, we're going to take over the enterprise market and we need to make sure that, you know, cooling doesn't need to be turned up in, in data centers. I get that. And I get correct. on some level you know, that reducing power consumption is, is generally always a good thing. But if you're like, I'm going for power users that probably already have a 600, you know, or 800 or 1,000 watt GP or power supply that they're, you know, using three or 400 watts on, um, 
is it you know is power consumption going to be that big a deal? I mean, I would think not. So, or, or are they I, just afraid they're going to get hammered by Nvidia's marketing? No, I mean they're definitely going to do that. I, I mean, you're correct in that performance per watt to the consumer means way less than performance per dollar. But when mm -hmm. your performance per dollar is the same or very close between two products, then the differentiation points start to mean more after that, right? So it, now you're talking right. about like, okay, which one has the better driver ecosystem? Which one of these has, um, you know, has the, the lower noise fans? Which one of these is, is going to draw the less power? I don't have to have as big a heat sink or a power supply, sorry. And keep in mind that it's not an insignificant difference, right? The GTX 1080, not the 1080 Ti, the 1080 is a 180 watt card. And AMD's Vega Frontier Edition, in this case, with the liquid cooler, to pretty much match performance is 350 watts. So you're talking about 170 watt difference, almost double the power necessary okay. for this card. Maybe they didn't sink in now, the first time. <laughs> well, and I, I, kept, I kept comparing it to the 1080 Ti power as well. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the difference of, you know, you need a 500 watt power supply to run a 1080 with the processor and all that type of stuff versus, you know, needing a 700 watt power supply or something like that, right? Like there, there, there is a difference. And, you know, if you're, if you're drawing 175 watts more power to get the same level of performance, that's, that's a lot. Um, yeah. Do I think it's going to prevent enthusiasts and, and DIY and builders from, from buying these cards? I really don't because... You can find 700 watt, 600 watt power supplies. You're going to be able to do this, and it's not. They're not going to be super expensive, and you know all, all these types of things. If as long as AMD makes all the right decisions in terms of positioning and pricing and and that type of stuff. So, um, no, it's not as important. But assuming that everybody's intelligent enough to make, and by everybody I mean AMD and Nvidia, to make these things price competitive, price per performance per dollar competitive, then you have no choice but to look at the other things, right? The other parts of the ecosystem, software, right. power draw, features, game support, that type of stuff. So it's, um, it, I think it will be important, uh, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. There are still some people out there that believe that AMD has some magic card up its sleeve that's going to make up 20% in performance through drivers and enabling a Raster is a different rasterize or tile based rasterization and um, uh, the high bandwidth cache controller. And I don't believe any of this is true. Uh, I think they might be able to find another five to 7% somewhere. Um, but then keep in mind that like when they come up with the RX Vega, they're going to, they'll, they'll have a water cooled card, mm -hmm. but they're going to have not water cooled options too. And so those cards performance, we already kind of know where that's going to be, right? Unless, right. unless they depend on, um, uh, third-party cooler designs that are going to be more efficient without being noisy like uh, the blower style that we see in the reference design, the Frontier Edition. So, see in like two weeks. <laughs> I was also going to say the same people who believe that there's magic drivers are probably also the one who are, are going to buy AMD no matter what the power delta is or the thermal there's, delta, the TP. Yeah. Um, there are definitely some of those. Yeah. There are a few of those. On a completely random note, uh, Intel has apparently uh, shut down its entire. I mean, they 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 sort of been had working had been working towards, you know, okay, we're going to do these low end parts for Internet of Things, uh, and now their entire smartwatch and fitness tracker group has apparently been. Um, well, eighty percent of the team, CNBC says, that made the basis smartwatch in November has been laid off. Uh, the entire division has been eliminated, um, and they're apparently refocusing on virtual reality. Um, you know, which reminds me uh, of a number of the chases we've seen uh, Microsoft doing over the past few years. Um, but yeah, uh, the uh, Intel is now all about the VR. And uh, the other thing that was interesting is uh, Microsoft, of all people, uh, have unveiled a Cortana-powered thermostat called Glass. Uh, they're working with Johnson Controls to build it, Johnson Controls being very, very big in HVAC, um, uh, because apparently they needed something running uh, Windows 10 Internet of Things Core Edition. Um, this is right up on the well, cards that I caught on this one. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, no, I mean, literally, like, I, it was, I, that was literally my reaction. Um, you know, um, 
I, you know, as as Intel's abandoning the Internet of Things, and uh, uh, you know, um, the company that kind of invented it, uh, Nest, uh, may or may not be spinning in circles. Personally, if I was buying a new uh, thermostat right now, I would probably be buying uh, an Ecobee three, um, mm. you know, or an Ecobee three Lite. Um, although I understand that the newer versions of the Nest Learning thermostat are considerably better than the one I bought. There's things I love about the Nest thermostat, but there's so many features on it that were just abysmal. Um, for example, when it would try to turn the uh, you know heat off in the house because nobody was there, despite the fact that my wife and children were in the same room as the thermostat. Um, <laughs> that and, and adding new thermal settings at the drop of a hat. Um, was a little frustrating but the uh mm. i just thought it was fascinating you know like so you're gonna have cortana voice control built into a thermostat um from microsoft so uh no idea um you know it's funny because you know nest can you know uh i, I yeah uh i'm very curious you know there's there's no reason you couldn't do this with like oh, this got a lot of control system sorry everybody um and i'm also very curious to see what the pricing on this is going to be because uh the design looks absolutely fabulous you can see that sort of see-through screen the wall mounting um yeah, that's also probably a rendering and not an actual real object but uh i'm curious that you know i'm down with the translucent touchscreen display um i'm yes. terrified by what the pricing on that's going to be yes um <laughs> in more rational numbers uh or more rational thoughts from Intel, or actually, I'm sure you know laying off people is perfectly rational. Um, and I'm sorry mm. for everybody who got shut down in that uh, round of layoffs. But um, quad core <laughs> Cobby Lake R CPUs for ultra portables. What are we going to see performance wise on these? Do we? Do you have a guess? Um, so there, there's actually been some leaks uh, into like something like Geekbench. Right of, of some right. of these model numbers already, and I think if you look in Ken's story, he talks about um, if you compare the Core i5 8520U, which is apparently the quad-core hyper-threaded um, Cabby Lake R versus the 7200U, uh, you see a 54% increase in multi-threaded performance and a 7% increase in single-threaded performance. Um, the real, I mean, the cool thing about this potential rumor, which seems pretty likely with all the data coming around, is that you're going to get 15 watt parts that now have quad core hyper threaded integration on. Right. Them, right. Which, that's which what, basically means. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that's what that's what has me excited because a lot of the low power parts. Um, it have been fine as long as you didn't stray away from like I'm typing into a Google Doc, I'm opening a Google Sheet, I'm sending an email. But as soon as you try to do anything more taxing to the processor, you know your experience would just nosedive. So I'm kind of excited about a 15 watt part with with yeah. quad cores. Um, Be because the problem is when you if you wanted to buy a 15 or a 15 if you wanted to buy a quad core actual quad core laptop, you pretty much had to sacrifice. Um, look and style and kind of like the thin and light designs uh, that, that you wanted. And in, in generally, you know, you had lower quality features, lower quality displays, not always, but sometimes. Uh, and and with, with offering a 15 watt version, it now means you can get the potential of that performance in all kinds of different form factors. Now there's other things to, to think about if the leaked specs from uh, this Acer Swift 3 are true, right? They list a base clock of 1.6 and a boost clock of 3.4. Turbo clock. Mm -hmm. That's a huge gap, right? That's almost a two gigahertz gap between base and the turbo boost, uh, which is indicative of the thermal envelope and environment that it has to work in. Basically, because the base clock is like what they guarantee all these cores are going to be able to work at with the cooling solutions necessary for the 15 watt environment, right? So, right. If you're if you're if you're doing like an hour long render, chances are you're going to run close down to these base clocks. Uh, mm -hmm. where you're utilizing all eight threads at one time. If, however, you are doing something like uh, a Photoshop uh, a filter effect or something like that, that maybe takes five seconds to run on a large image that you're editing, chances are you'll be able to use all quad cores, all four of those cores, for that full five seconds at close to that max turbo speed, maybe 3.2 or 3.3 or 3.0 or whatever right. it's going to be. Because the 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 
The laws of thermodynamics say the processor and the heat sink don't heat up instantly. It takes a little time. So as long as the processor is down into its lower state quickly enough, you don't have to worry about overheating any of the components inside. So that's that's really that's kind of like what I imagine the difference is going to be in these parts is the bigger machines that are going to have 35 watt parts are just going to say, hey, we can run fully loaded for longer periods of time at higher clock speeds. Whereas on the 15 watt iterations, it's for more of those short bursts of when do you need quad core computing, right? But still being able to get up into those high as 3.4 in your single threaded workloads for snappy responsiveness, touchscreen interaction, all that type of stuff that still really matters uh, for this class of mm -hmm. machine. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, so I, yeah, interesting, I, interesting. I, I think it'll be interesting. There are also some people who have, I think, erroneously been reporting that the 8000 series were um, coffee lake when it's they're not, at least according to all this data. They're still Cabby Lake, hmm. not a new architecture, just a different kind of packaging and binning of uh, of parts. Good to know. Yeah. Memory is uh, memory price has been up a little bit, uh, driven primarily by the extraordinary amount of RAM uh, being put into, amongst other things, cell phones in China uh, and the ramping up of, of memory being needed for more and more things out there in the universe, including uh, automotive uh, applications. Samsung has increased the production of the industry's fastest DRAM, 8 gigabyte HBM2, to address rapidly growing market demand. So was, uh, was Alan particularly excited about this or is this kind of something that seems obvious? Because, you know, <laughs> apparently RAM is back, baby. Well, so this this is, so the HBM2 stuff is not, that's, Vega uses HBM2, right? Right. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it, the, it, is, it is incredibly high end. I should not, I should not, you know, yeah. I should not conflate this with the DRAM that's being used on phones or the, you know. Uh, or or in sure, your sure, sure. desktop computer. My bad. Sorry. It, um, yeah, no, no. But it's I, I was just I was trying to figure out how I was gonna say like so basically if you look at the a lot of the problems surrounding AMD's Vega release is about the high cost of HBM2 memory. They made a decision years ago to go with HBM2, and as it turns out, it kind of bit them in the butt because they don't have uh, access to high volume HBM2 production. At least they have it until mm -hmm. this announcement, essentially. So that's why one of the reasons why Vega, RX Vega, Vega Frontier Edition are high priced and or they're going to have to really sacrifice their margin to kind of get prices where they need to be to compete against the GeForce line. Um, an announcement of like Samsung is, is kind of interesting for two reasons. One, it indicates that they're going to ramp up production, which should increase volume, which means it should, in theory, lower the cost of that memory to AMD and AMD's partners so that they can mm -hmm. make these chips and, and either sell them for the price that they want to sell them at or make a little bit more money while they're selling it at the price that they wanted to sell it at. Um, but they really, what we really need is like the second SK Hynix has, has announced HBM two, but only four gigabyte stacks, not eight gigabyte stacks. Um, although right. everybody kind of assumes that they're going to have an eight gigabyte stack uh, production line come up relatively soon. The sooner, the better um, as it means uh, that we will be able to see lower cost iterations of this, right? Because HBM, AMD is betting big on HBM, right? Not just for the super high end. Like the mainstream, this generation will still use GDDR5, 5X, 6, whatever it's going to be. Um, but like 2018, AMD on its roadmap still kind of says like, hey, we're going to use HBM memory, HBM2, like all the way down to the budget products. And if so, if you're going to do that, mm -hmm. you have that has to be a very high volume, low cost integration, so, uh, you know, these ramp ups are important. Um, and, you know, I think Samsung might also be ramping it up, trying to kind of counter any momentum that SK Hynix might make by making their announcements because they want to kind of make sure they're the they're the single best customer for that. But um, it, it's it's good to see. It's kind of like an inside baseball news story, but it's good to see in relation to like, hey, if you care about Vega and AMD's future product roadmap, you want news like that to come out. That not that right. things are slowing down and stalling, but instead the opposite. Things are are ramping up and producing and and becoming uh, a higher volume as quickly as possible. This is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, you've been thinking about uh, the Core i9 7900 uh, X series processor um, with its price tag and its uh, 
uh, cost of motherboards. Uh, pretty good article up on hardocp.com on overclocking the Intel Core i7, excuse me, Core i9 7900 series. Um, the uh, uh, I, I love the fact, if you go to the second page and scroll down, you'll see a shot of a multimeter uh, reading temperatures. And uh, one of the things they've done at Hard OCP for years uh, is they basically turn off the 120 millimeter fan just to see what happens. Um, quote, not every motherboard is up to 100%, 100% full load with zero airflow across the motherboard. And as you know, this is not something you should be doing anyway, as it's stupid. It's bad for your entire system to run a computer in a hot box. And uh, they note that even on their open test bench with an ambient temperature of around 75 degrees, the X99, X299 platform does not last long in terms of operating with no airflow. Um, you know, <laughs> You know, the crew at Hardware Speed says, you know, nothing wrong with the X299 platform in terms of power. It's an HEDT system. Um, but if you are going to be, uh, you know, getting serious about overclocking, uh, quote, I do think the X299 motherboard platform is getting near its limits in terms of enthusiast overclocking. Um Beyond mm -hmm. air and water cooling or CPU, I do not think the X299 platform will show to be a long-term stable solution. Because uh, uh, UFI tweaking and system cooling, you're going to have to be at your best. That's a pretty serious rig they put together for this one. So, um, yeah, you know they are stretching it out to its limits. Um, I also love the fact that you know they do the kill test where they <laughs> they turn the fan off. Do not do that at home. Uh, that sounds you, like a bad know, idea. But generally speaking, it is not a positive thing to do. Um, yeah, I'm actually looking forward to get the new uh, BIOS running on my uh, Ryzen 1800X, which should allow me to do some significantly improved uh, memory tuning on that one. So, hmm. see if we can get that loaded on there this week and report back on that next week. PCPro.com, ladies and gentlemen, that's where you can find more of Mr. Ryan Shrouts. And uh, are anything you can tease yet, or uh, is it all under the NDAs at this point? Oh man. Um, uh, let's see. I am. So if people have questions, thoughts, ideas that they want to, to see me answer as I stare into a webcam for 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to, I'm trying to do like a, a weekly, just like Ryan's rants type thing where people send me ideas and topics and I talk about it. So if you want to tweet me at Ryan Shrout, um, I, I'm probably going to record that tonight or tomorrow morning and try to have it up for over the weekend and, and see if anybody gives a crap about that type of stuff. Uh, Ryzen 3 is coming out on July 27th. We're currently testing that. Um, so we'll have some answers in terms of the budget end of AMD's Ryzen family and, and how it compares to nice. Core i3 through a different bunch of different stuff. And then um, I guess next, not this coming weekend, but the next weekend is like when all the SIGGRAPH, AMD, like Vega, uh, Threadripper stuff is all occurring. So, um, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're creeping up to, I mean, Lisa Sue, the CEO of AMD, said we'd have Threadripper in early August. I don't know what day that means yet, but soon still, I guess. <laughs> early August is coming up on us. Yeah. Which yeah, uh, I'm curious. Kind of shocking. For the AMD. <laughs> yeah. It's the... It's the children, man. They make everything go faster. Um, yeah. Man, like the Ryzen 3 1300X, um, which is quad core, mm -hmm. you know, 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, the rumors on Reddit right now, that could be as little as $129. Um, which parts are you most excited about from Ryzen 3? Um, you know, honestly, the, 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 the cheap, well, I think they're going to be close enough in price. That's not going to be a huge difference, but the cheaper one, uh, if, if it's, you know, a hundred, hundred twenty dollars something like that, it's going to be really competitive, mm -hmm. right? So you've got things like the Intel G4560 to compare it to, um, Core i3-7300 to compare it to, uh, and it, they're, these are true quad cores without SMT. Whereas the core right. i3s are dual core with hyper threading. So I'm very curious to see, um, you know, I, we still expect Intel to have single threaded performance advantages, although at the core i3 lineup, they don't clock them exceptionally high. So it's possible that maybe AMD is a little bit closer in single threaded results than, than they have been on the Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7. I just, I don't, I don't know. Um, but the multi-threaded workloads, I think will will show a pretty big advantage to to Ryzen, maybe. maybe you know, I, I think 
what right. what Ryzen Seven did was it be, was competitive with some of the HEDT Broadwell E line. Ryzen Five was surprisingly competitive with Core i Seven in some cases. And then right. I think we'll see Ryzen 3 be competitive with the Core i5 in some cases, especially when we're talking about multi-threaded workloads. And that's that's really AMD's sales pitch to the community and to you know OEMs and stuff is like, yeah, we're not going to win everything, but in the areas where we win, we're like we win we win pretty heavily and we're co more cost effective, right? So, and that's what they're doing with with Threadripper. That's what they're going to do with Ryzen. That's what they're doing with Epic. It's a very um, centralized mm -hmm. plan on the CPU side from from top down. Now I know, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, the pricing of these is significantly reduced. Are is the Ryzen three using the same socket as the Ryzen, the rest of the Ryzen lineup, or the rest of mm -hmm. the? Um, okay, are we? Yep, it yep, seems yep. like so same, Asus same and ASRock. And platforms. It seems like Asus and ASRock were preparing some less expensive AM four motherboards to go along with these, or these just motherboards that were coming out much later than the rest of the lineup. So the chipsets remain the same. You've got the X370, which is going to be the high end. I don't imagine you'll see Ryzen 3 being paired with with those motherboards. B350, <laughs> um, and then you've got the A320, I think is what it's called. And that is basically, right. like, all of them are, are feature equivalent, except for, like, the X370 supports multi-GPU. The bottom ones don't. The B350 supports overclocking. But the A320 does not. So like the A320 missing is missing overclocking and multi-GPU. And then the B350 is only missing multi-GPU and the X370 has all of those. So um, I think there are there are quite a few low-cost B350 motherboards that will make sense for, for Ryzen uh -huh. 3. Um, and I, and I, think, I think the performance will be good enough, especially for like things like gaming where quad-core, like true quad-core will be advantageous over two-core hyper-threading. That, you know, you can put a 1060, 1070, you know, a moderate to high end GPU in these systems and still have a really good overall, uh, you know, solution for that without right. having to go up to Ryzen 7 or up to Core i7 to, to, to make it happen. So I haven't seen any of the A320 motherboards myself yet, so I don't know exactly, you know, how bare bones budget these are going to be. So even though the chipsets might be feature equivalent, it doesn't mean the board vendors implement all the same technologies on them. So like our A320 board is going to be, you know, without M.2 ports or something like that, or only right. have two SATA ports or four SATA ports or whatever it's going to be. Um, just okay. things to keep in mind as you look around at the, at the budget end of that. When you look at A320 boards, it's also amazing. Like you're, you're looking at 70 to $90 and a B350 board is starting at $89. Um, Right. So if you're never going to overclock, uh, overclock A320 makes sense, um, but you're not saving a huge amount of money um, going to uh, an A320 powered motherboard. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, okay, here's one that's down to like three hundred and twenty dollars. Um, yeah, you know, uh, but to me, here's one that's down to sixty two dollars. An A320M that's down to sixty two dollars, but uh, yeah, oh, you're still yeah. talking about twenty seven dollars. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness! So uh, the July twenty seventh is supposed to be the launch date. Is that going to be when they start selling them, or are they going to sort of build the hype with reviews and then start selling them afterwards? I I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think they're going to be for sale on the twenty seventh. I think okay. I think that's the case. Yeah. yeah. Good to know. And then the boards are already um, out there, and the memory is already out there. Every they're, we're just waiting on the processors. So I, right. I think they're going to be sale for sale on the twenty seventh, and then. You know they'll they'll still they'll start teasing the Vega Threadripper stuff for launches uh you know a couple of weeks down the road. Very cool, man. We uh I went nuts with uh, a bunch of iperf testing uh, with uh, wireless adapters, and that's one of the things we go into on Tech Thing next week is looking at. Uh, hey, I, I think my my new hobby is figuring out new and exciting ways for Windows or manufacturers to reduce. Uh, Wi-Fi performance, um, because in one case I found a global driver that dropped performance by 50%, a Windows 10 recommended driver upgrade that dropped performance by like 60 or 70%. Um, you know, and then it's amazing also uh, how much uh, antenna location, uh, especially on a, uh, a 802.11 AC adapter, uh, can impact performance, um, as in taking you from say 70 megabits down to two megabits because it fell down beside uh, behind your monitor. But it was curious. Um, it was curious to realize how messed up the driver situation is. 
uh, and how little uh, impact. You know, it, it, I, I wasn't doing a lot of stuff where I was, say, copying massive files over USB 3.0 at the same time while using a USB 3.0 uh, adapter. Um, but in mo most cases, if you're not like right next to your router, the throughput you're going to get on 802.11ac uh, is not going to give you a particularly heinous uh, USB 3.0 experience versus PCI Express. Um, also, Ethernet still rules <laughs> in terms yep. of maximum performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that was that was fun to start running through that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Shannon got hands on with the Bit Defender uh, box, which is their standalone device for the Internet of Things. So, well, actually, it protects everything in your house, and as a side effect, it does that for the Internet of Things. But uh, if you've been a little uptight about uh, keeping your network safe, that might be uh, something worth looking at. Although it turns out they're releasing a brand new one at the end of this year which is going to be a significant improvement um, in terms of processing power, uh, especially if you try to operate it as a standalone device. The Bitdefender box is perhaps the worst standalone router ever. Um, mm. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, how it performs versus its competitors. But uh, go to techthing.com and, and check the video on that for the, the whole story. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us here on... Uh, on This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find more of our episodes at twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H. And uh, we invite you to go over there, find our older episodes, learn how to subscribe to the show. You can find Ryan at PCPer.com. You can find me at techthing.com and avxl.com. And as always, we want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Stroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.